Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dina Kitabi, I'm a professor at MIT, and I'm going to tell you about contrastive learning and how to make it robust to a problem called shortcuts and how to make it more generalizable to new data modalities, particularly modalities that are hard to interpret by humans, such as radio signals. So in computer vision, we use visible light to see objects. However, we all know that visible light does not traverse occlusions and walls. But if we allow ourselves to use another part of the spectrum, particularly radio signals, then radio signals traverse walls and occlusions and they reflect off the human body because our bodies are full of water. And if we analyze these reflections, say using a neural network, then we can start being able to track some form of through wall vision. So we can track how people move and get some information about them through obstacles and walls. So I'm going to show you here how we can do pose estimation through wall using a radio signal. So uh, here is my student. And as he goes behind the wall, you're gonna see that we will be able to use radio signal to extract his pose purely using the radio signal. We follow him, we follow his stick uh, figure using the radio signal through the wall. And this pose estimation problem is a standard problem in computer vision, but typically you do it through images and videos. And uh, here, what we are able to do, we are using the radio signal to do the same thing, pose estimation, but we can now do it through walls. Now, another thing that is interesting about radio signal is that it provides you with depth. So you can use one radio to get depth so that you can get 3D pose as opposed to 2D pose, which is what you get just uh, using images. So here I'm changing a bit uh, the representation. So this big frame is the output of our neural network and uh, you can see 3D poses here. And the image here on the side is uh, so that you can see what people are doing inside the room. And remember we are capturing this through also. Now, as I played the video, you can see how people are moving and you can see that we are able to capture their movement through the wall and also in 3D using a single radio. And because radio signals do not care about lighting, now you can capture this information in dark scenarios, as well as you can see different types of postures uh, so here you see somebody writing on the wall, people are sitting, and here's one of them stands, uh, and you can capture that, you can capture all of these poses just purely using radio signals. And radio signals not only allows, allow you to see through walls and occlusions, but actually to some extent, they allow you to see kind of like inside the person. They allow you to tap into their uh, vital signs and physiological signals of the individuals uh, without touching them. So I'm going to show you a few examples. So when you go to, uh, to bed, for example, and you sleep, your, your brain waves change and you enter different sleep stages, awake, light sleep, deep sleep, rapid eye movements, or REM. Now, these sleep stages are important for um, both for, for sleep disorders, but they are also important for a variety of diseases. For example, REM is the stage during which, which you, you dream and is important, is related to uh, disturbance in REM is are related to depression. Deep sleep is related to Alzheimer's. Now, of course, uh, you can use a camera and perhaps it can tell you whether somebody is asleep or awake. But a camera would not be able to tell you that somebody is, is asleep, but they are in REM stage, they are dreaming versus they are in deep sleep or light sleep. Today, if you want to get this information, you send somebody to a sleep lab and they put all of these electrodes on the, his head and body and they ask him to sleep like this. Now, of course, this is not comfortable and uh, is difficult to, to, to sleep with all of these sensors. Now with radio signals, you can get the same level of information, these sleep stages. Here's our device. We transmit very low power wireless signal, analyze the reflection using uh, specialized neural networks, and we can spit out the sleep stages throughout the night. And as you can see, uh, the radio signal, uh, the radio is away from the person, he, they, we don't ask the person to wear wearables or anything like that. There are no cameras, there are no electrodes on his head or body. 
And the accuracy actually is comparable to having these electrodes and then having a sleep uh, technicians try to extract the sleep stages of the person. Now, here is another example. This person is sitting like you guys are sitting right now. And uh, what you see on the screen is his breathing, his exhale and in, his inhales and exhales. We ask him to hold his breath and you can see the signal stays at a steady level because he exhaled, he did not inhale. So um, I'll show you these examples and hopefully I convince you that learning from radio signal is very interesting and can open up so many opportunities, both in health, uh, in the healthcare and learning physiological metric, as well as in extending computer vision to be able to deal with occlusions and uh, seeing through walls. So all of these tasks that I described to you, typically we learn them using supervised learning. Uh, and to do that, you have to label radio signals and labeling radio signals is actually very difficult. If you think about it, I cannot give someone, I cannot give a human radio signal and say label for me the skeleton here or label for me the sleep stages of the person. That's not doable because radio signals are not interpretable by humans. So when people try to collect these label data, they build typically sophisticated labeling systems that, and they synchronize these labeling systems with the radio to be able to label the signal. It is a um, difficult operation and expensive and exhausting. So if we can learn without labels, that would be very useful. So uh, being able to learn from just the radio signal, you can put a radio, that's very easy, and collect radio signals. And if you can use that to learn self-supervised representation using, using contrastive learning, then it would significantly reduce the overhead of these tasks and hopefully improve the overall performance. So we tried contrastive learning on radio signal, and we tried it exactly on the task that I described to you, which is to take radio signal and try to learn from it 3D representation of the pose. And just to give you some context, so if you use fully su uh, supervised neural network for this task, then you can achieve an error on average that is 3.8 centimeter. That is the error in localizing in 3D each one of the key points on the body, like the head, the knee, the hip, the, the error on average for the, these key points is going to be about 3.8 centimeter. Now, on the other hand, you can take a, a fully random representation. So we took the same network and initialize it randomly and we get a random representation. And on top of this representation, we can use it now with a linear classifier. And in that case, the error is six centimeters. So almost doubled. Now, of course, you would expect the contrastive learning to give you some error that is between these two. It's not gonna be as good as fully supervised information, but at the same time, it's going to be hopefully much better than a random representation based on the input. So we use our uh, state-of-the-art contrastive learning uh, approaches such as Simpler, Moco, and Beyond, and here are the results. So we were shocked to see that the error are actually higher, higher than random representation. Now the error actually becomes on average eight centimeters as opposed to six centimeters with a random initialization and 3.8 with the full supervision. So what's going on here? So what, ha what is happening is this problem that is called the shortcut. So basically, contrastive learning is learning something. In fact, as you are training these networks, you can see that the contrastive loss is decreasing uh, properly. However, what, is what, what the contrastive learning is learning is a shortcut information. It's learning information that is irrelevant to the task of interest and discarding the information that is relevant to the task of interest. And this discarding, this is like because it is removing the information that is relevant because of the shortcut causes the error to increase as opposed to decrease. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you more about this shortcut problem and I'm going to show you a, uh, an idea for a solution to address this problem and then show you how that improves the results significantly. 
So let's go back to the basics of contrastive learning. And it's easier to talk about contrastive learning, of course, in the context of images, because then you can visually see, some, the, see the images themselves and the information. So in contrastive learning, we, we take, for example, uh, each image and we create positive pairs, which are just some modification of this image without uh, that would maintain the semantic information, the fact, for example, here that the image is a cat, but will alter the image in a particular way that would not change the semantic information. We call these positive pairs. And then the rest of the images in the data set act as, a negative, as negative pairs. And then contrastive learning will learn a representation that ensures that the positive pairs are close to each other in the feature space and the negative pairs are away from each other. Unfortunately, however, contrastive learning is uh, vulnerable to shortcuts. So what happens with, with contrastive learning, as we saw earlier, is that there can be shortcuts, which are information that is irrelevant to the task. And one of the very early shortcuts that is widely known is color distribution. In particular, so when you have these images, the contrastive learning scheme can, can learn the color distribution of the image as opposed to the semantic information that the image has a cat and use that color distribution and it does not need to learn the semantic information. And that will dramatically degrade the performance of contrastive learning. And people traditionally try to address this problem using something called data augmentation. That is, you, you create a data augmentation that break the shortcut. So in this case, because the shortcut is color distribution, so you can jitter the color, you can use grayscale and so on to create these positive pairs. And indeed, it addresses the problem. However, when you use data augmentation, it makes contrastive learning vulnerable to these data augmentations. So in particular, we can uh, look at the performance of contrastive learning as we remove these augmentations. So here, uh, what we're going to show, this is simpler, for example, on ImageNet 100, and you can see the degradation of the performance. So the performance degrades by about 32% uh, accuracy reduction in accuracy for simpler when you remove these data augmentation, particularly the augmentation re uh, related to color distribution. Now, MoCo and Biol are slightly better, but still, I mean, their performance degrades by 15% in their accuracy in comparison to having these data augmentation. But you might ask, okay, so what's the big deal? I mean, let's use the data augmentation and that will solve the problem. But unfortunately, it doesn't really solve the full problem because on one hand, we have all of these data modalities that are hard to interpret by humans, like the one that I showed you, radio signals or acceleration or similar, or even like medical information, which are hard to, to interpret by a machine learning scientist and it requires a domain knowledge. So when you have such signals that you cannot interpret as a designer, it's very hard to come up with a handcrafted data augmentation to eliminate the shortcut. But even in RGB, even in data that it's hard for us to understand like images, Sometimes data augmentation just doesn't work and doesn't eliminate the shortcut. So let me give you example from tasks that require um, multi-attribute uh, multi uh, learning. So for example, consider the, the, the following image, set of images. So let's say that the background has some object for example, here, the background is from STL uh, 10. And, the, uh, and it also, the image has a digit. So, uh, so there is a background object, there is a digit object. So each one of these images, you can run a multi-attribute classification where you are interested in classifying both the digit and the background of this image. Now, if you want fully supervised uh, neural network on this, you can achieve uh, even with simple network the following accuracy. Now, if you use the same network to learn a representation with contrastive learning, you can see that the background classification tasks, uh, you can get reasonable accuracy on it. However, the digit classification is very poor. So the accuracy reduces from very high accuracy in, in the 90s 
in the 90% to like only accuracy of 15% on identifying the digit. So what is going on here? Why we, the, the contrastive learning is failing miserably on something that is as simple as identifying these digits? And the reason is what we talked about, which is the shortcut problem. So the background information that contrastive learning is learning from, from, this, from the image, from the background of the image, is creating the contrastive information. And it's creating a shortcut that is preventing uh, contrastive learning from focusing on the digit-related features, and as a result, is not learning it. So you have, a, you have background here acting as a shortcut to prevent learning the digit. And this, again, not only is limited to synthesized images. So if you consider, for example, uh, like images of faces, like fair face, and if you would run a multi-attribute classification on ethnicity, gender, and age in these images, you will discover that ethnicity can act as a shortcut. And it partially reduces the ability of uh, learning the gender, for example, and the age. This means that we need a solution for this shortcut problem that would allow us to generalize contrastive learning to new data modality where we cannot just simply hand graft data augmentation and also would allow the representation learned with contrastive learning to support many uh, downstream tasks and multi-attribute classification. So what can we do? So let me tell you our idea. So we are going to do, uh, we, we are going to have to combine uh, contrastive learning with reconstructive learning. So let me explain this. So if you think about it, the problem of shortcut is a problem of loss of information in the representation. So the information was in the input, but somehow contrastive le learning discarded that, inf that information in the representation. So we want to force the representation to keep the information in the input. And the way to do that is with reconstructive learning, by trying to make the representation reconstruct the input. But preserving the information that was in the input is not sufficient, of course. I mean, all the information was in the input in the first place. So what we want, still we want contrastive learning now that we preserve the information, we want contrastive learning to reorganize this information in the feature space to make it easy to classify this information with a linear classifier. So in our approach, which we call RCL, because it is both reconstructive and contrastive learning, we have two branches. The first branch is contrastive. It's very similar to contrastive learning. It takes uh, these positive pairs and negative pairs and uh, train with uh, basically an encoder, a uh, projection head, and the contrastive learning loss that we are all familiar with. But there is a second branch, which is the reconstructive branch, which, which takes the same set of images, the same anchors, but actually it adds a reconstructive task. And in our case here, we are using in-painting because in-painting is a task that we can apply to a variety of data modalities, but almost any reconstructive task is going to improve the performance. So here we are adding a reconstructive branch and we are encoding this, this image that we, we in-painted with the same encoder by sharing the parameter with the contrastive branch, but we are applying a reconstructive loss on a decoder and forcing this, uh, this representation to keep the information to reconstruct the original input. And finally, we are training these two branches with the combined loss of reconstructive and contrastive learning. So uh, we took this approach and we applied it widely across various data modality versus data set and versus various tasks. And I wanna show you some of the results and how this can actually, this framework of changing the way we do contrastive learning can make us robust to, 
to shortcuts without having to handcraft data augmentations. So the first thing that I'm going to look at is uh, basically the, the representation learned using RCL and how it deals with uh, the lack of data augmentations. So remember this graph where we eliminated these data augmentation in ImageNet 100, and we saw that simpler performance uh, drops by 32%. MoCo and Biol uh, performance drop by uh, about 15%. And here is RCL. So as you can see, the performance drop is actually significantly smaller, is only 7%. And it provides much better uh, uh, robustness to the lack of these data augmentation. Now we can ask the second question, okay, so how about uh, multi-attribute classification? Is this representation now with RCL able to preserve information about different types of semantics? So we can take uh, the same example that we saw before, which is this colorful MNES. And now uh, you look at this uh, contrastive learning as before, the accuracy on the digit representation is very low, about 15%. However, RCL can achieve very high uh, accuracy on digit, 88%, much closer to the supervised learning, while at the same time maintaining more or less the same accuracy on background classification. So now we are learning a representation that has multiple semantics instead of taking one semantic, one type of semantics and using it as a shortcut around some other types of, uh, of semantics. And the same thing we see also in fair phase. So here we are doing multi-attribute classification on uh, age, gender, and ethnicity. Uh, you can see that ethnicity kind of like act as a, a shortcut. Its, it's uh, performance is more or less very close to, to the supervised learning for all, for all schemes. However, for example, when you look at gender, you can see that contrastive learning significantly uh, reduces the accuracy on gender, while in, in RCL, we can keep the accuracy on gender also pretty close to the supervised learning method. So the representation that we get has information about all of these tasks in, instead of focusing on some subset of these semantics. Finally, let's look uh, at RF signal where we started. And as we said here, actually, it's very hard to design handcrafted augmentation. So let's see whether this kind of uh, RCL uh, framework allows us to better learn representation in, in, in a self-supervised manner. So here again, um, I'm showing you the uh, 3D pose estimation and I'm showing you the error. I'm putting the error in millimeters this time just to give you a bit more resolution on the error. And as you can see, basically, again, the contrastive learning has higher error than purely having a random uh, representation. Uh, while you can see RCL has significantly better uh, representation uh, so we can take that representation, it's achieved much closer accuracy to, sell, uh, to full supervision, even if we just fix the representation. Now we can ask a different question, what happens if we don't fix the representation? Can we actually use this unlabeled uh, self-supervision mechanism to improve the performance even if we had label, if, even if we had supervision? So instead of just looking at uh, the fixed extractor uh, setting, now, what we do is we can use the representation that we learned using uh, whichever of these schemes and use it, uh, start with it and use it as initialization and then fine, fine tune the, uh, the neural network output using the uh, supervision. And as we can see, I mean, full supervision, I'll still get the same, uh, the same accuracy or the same error. Now you can see that all of this, these contrastive learning schemes, they don't actually reduce the error, like just starting with a contrastive representation or initializing with a random representation did not buy you much. But if you look here, actually initializing with the RCL representation buys you a lot, significant reduction in the error. 
So, uh, so what I showed you here is that contrastive learning is vulnerable to these shortcuts to learning information that is irrelevant to the task that you are interested in. And uh, that information, using that information to discard information that, that is of interest. And we saw that by combining uh, contrastive learning within this framework that has a branch about reconstruction or RCL, it allows us to uh, improve performance dramatically making contrastive learning robust to shortcut. And also, because there are no handcrafted augmentations, it's easy to generalize to modalities that are hard to interpret by humans, such as radio signals. Uh, at the end, I want to, of course, acknowledge my collaborators, which are uh, our MIT students, postdoc, and also our collab collaborator uh, from IBM, Dr. Rogerio Ferris. Thank you.